along the east bank of the Jordan River, archaeologists are preparing for the visit of Pope John Paul. This site, just over the border from Israel, was a minefield until the signing of the peace accord between Israel and Jordan in 1994. This is the proof of the peace also to have the Pope in this site. Call it a modern version of swords into plowshares, but as the landmines were cleared away and the sands of time lifted up bucket by bucket, just look at what was discovered. This is dating back to the early Roman period. Pottery that dates back thousands of years, coins, an archway that once supported a chapel maybe 1,500 years ago, ancient baptismal pools, mosaic church floors, and most tantalizing of all, the possibility that down this path, along the Jordan River, Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist. The evidence for the baptism of Jesus here in Jordan on the east bank of the river really is strongest when you put together the three different sources, the archaeological evidence, the biblical text itself, and the early Byzantine or mid-Byzantine uh, text, say, from the 4th to the 7th century AD, that pinpoints this area here as the place where John was and where Jesus was baptized. Although Jordan is predominantly Muslim, the king says the Pope's visit is extremely important. He says it's another symbol of hope that we need at the start of a new century. We have talked for many years of having peace for our children and their children, and I think that we've got this completely wrong. Uh, we should have peace for ourselves and our children and their children. And I believe that uh, um, if we're going to start a new century, a new millennium, um, I, I believe that God wants us to start it in the right way. Uh, and we're at, the, uh, at the, the brink of being able to break down all these barriers and have peace and stability once and for all in this area. So now that Jordan and Israel enter the new millennium as peaceful neighbors, many hope that the only fighting to be done along this border will be over tourist dollars. And we are now seeing our first images of the Pope touching down in Amman, Jordan. We want to bring these to you. Uh, John Paul II, there is his plane, the Alitalia jet on the runway. You see King Abdullah there. He is the King of Jordan, the son of the late King Hussein, familiar to, uh, to many, I'm sure. That is uh, King Abdullah there with the, um, the uh, traditional... Kafil. Uh, Kafil, thank you. And, uh, and we are awaiting the Pope's arrival here. He will step from his plane any moment. I do want to mention, uh, we should talk about Jordan. This is 4.8 million inhabitants. Uh, only 60,000 of them, by the way, or 250,000 Christians, 60,000 Catholics, so a very tiny uh, Catholic uh, minority here. The relationship between Muslims and Catholics in this region, Father, have you any notion? Well, uh, we have quite a few churches in Jordan, mm -hmm. in Amman and other places, Aleppo, we've ha we have schools. In fact, some of our schools in the area that we have are mainly a Muslim population that we're educating. Now, I saw so that. I saw in one of the reports they had 54 students graduated, all 54 were Muslim in one mm -hmm. of the schools mm -hmm. uh, run by... So we're, we, I, at least speaking from the Franciscan point of view, as representatives of the church there, we are welcome. There's a little difficulty living in Jordan. We have to remember that Jordan used to extend into East Jerusalem at one time, before the 67 war, I remember that mm -hmm. time. So I would say that the relations are good in Jordan between, even though a small population, a respected population, and a perhaps not thriving at this time, but at least they are living, w living uh, well among the people. They're doing their best. Pat, your thoughts on this uh, relationship between Muslims and Catholics and Christians in, in the region at this time? Well, in the, uh, the places that I have been in Palestine and in Israel, I've never noticed any tension. Uh, I've never gotten the sense that there was any friction between the two groups. I think that uh, in some ways the tensions may be uh, hidden from our view. And then it also in some ways I think our, our press has a tendency to maybe play up tensions that are not quite as big as, as they really are. <laughs> they may appear bigger on the, on the television screen here than they really are. Uh, certainly the three groups, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, are uh, united in the sense that, that they all look to the same God as the Holy Father says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we have that that unites us. But those differences 
are still being worked out. And I think we will see great unity here between the uh, Muslims and Christians as, as this leg of the pilgrimage evolves. The Pope will land today, he lands today in Amman, he'll spend really only 26 hours there. But tomorrow there's an enormous mass at uh, the Amman Stadium. And I'm told there's a Christian Muslim choir, the majority of whom are Muslim, and they'll be singing Catholic hymns and, yes. uh, and the like at the Mass. So it'll be a beautiful sign of that unity mm -hmm. as, uh, as we move into this next millennium, which is obviously a great hope for the Holy Father. It's Father. Yeah, it, it's interesting, too, that um, we think that living as we do here in the United States, though down here in Birmingham, there's only 2% Catholic. And there is a difference come from a land up north where it's the majority of the people are Catholic and Christian. And I'm going, okay, to, go ahead. I'm going yeah. to interrupt you for a moment as John sure. Paul II steps off the plane. Here is his arrival in the Holy Land, 20 plus years in the making. You're watching live coverage of John Paul II's historic pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Cardinal Sedano there, the S Vatican Secretary of State, and Bishop Stanislaw Zivic behind him following the Holy Father. Out of his Jubileo plane there, I see the uh, Jubilee 2000 uh, logo on the door of the plane. John Paul II stepping out alone and to the uh, to the staircase leading down to the tarmac. He's going down alone. Yes, he is going down alone. No cane or anything. Uh, and it's amazing because you, you always see from time to time he'll have a cane and then the next time you see him he won't. So it's he has his good days and his bad, but recently it seems he's been having a whole lot of good days. Going to show this is the start of a very tiring journey, of course, for John Paul II. Uh, his spiritual vitality is not lessened by one's physical vitality, but he's very strong spiritually and he will continue to move. And this man should be the poster child of spiritual vitality, I think. You, you see him uh, renewing himself endlessly. It's the grace of God certainly not uh, not anything that we as human beings can do, but it's God's grace working in us. Pope slowly making his way down the uh, staircase to the tarmac, where he will be greeted by King Abdullah. King Abdullah, by the way, sent a letter out um, uh, he's gonna kiss earlier this, um, this morning, uh, a letter through the uh, Italian press saluting the Pope, welcoming him as a figure of peace, and uh, embracing him. And he quoted the, the Quran at one point, uh, mentioning uh, the tolerance and uh, devotion they have toward His Holiness. John Paul II here greeting the, uh, the wife of King Abdullah. Tens of thousands of well-wishers, by the way, will greet the Pope as he makes his way to Mount Nabal, which is the first scheduled event of today after this brief welcoming ceremony. It is mid-afternoon in, uh, in Amman, Jordan. Here we see some doves being released. I don't think they took off. They seem to be... Uh, they didn't want to fly. Yes, I think they'd rather just stay near the Pope there on the tarmac. <laughs> There were some reports that the Pope had a cut on his head. Uh, yes, at yesterday's Mass, it was uh, noted by some of the Italian media. We see the Pope now uh, holding his cane as he makes his way forward. It's amazing he can take the stairs with no difficulty, but uh, uses the cane once he hits the flat ground. That could also be his uh, assistants urging him to use the cane. Right. He may, he may prefer not to, but willing to listen to their advice large uh, party, the papal entourage, coming down the staircase behind him. And uh, the beginning of this historic, long-sought pilgrimage. John Paul II has been wanting to do this for nearly 21 years now. He wanted to do it when he was first elected pontiff. And uh, his advisors and the curia told him it was out of the question. And for once, he listened to them. <laughs> but now, 21 years later, he is finally making this long-sought pilgrimage. The, returning to the, the cut on his head, uh, we'll remember when the Pope uh, took a spill in Poland 
uh, cut his head um, and appeared at the mass with a band-aid uh, atop his head. At yesterday's mass, we are told in reports, he had a similar band-aid there. Today, that band-aid is removed, but uh, there is some sort of gash on his head. No explanation from the Vatican as to what caused uh, the cut. A but number of his uh, injuries have been ironically sustained as a result of a fall when right. he uh, hurt his shoulder and of course his hip. Right. Uh, seems as though that is becoming an increasing uh, uh, problem. But it doesn't seem to have deterred him no. or slowed him down Not in the all. least. Not at all. And we see him now uh, making his way down the greeting line greeting the well-wishers. This is EWTN's live coverage of John Paul II's historic pilgrimage to the Holy Land, a papal jubilee pilgrimage. I'm joined by Pat Madrid, Father Kevin Fresco, and Father Francis Mary Stone. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We will, of course, be bringing you the upcoming welcoming ceremony. John Paul II will make a very brief speech um, and then he will proceed to Mount Nebo. There'll be a half hour lag in the midst, but uh, I don't think that will slow anybody down. Father Francis, you wanted to add something here as we watch yeah, the Pope? As it, all this unfolds and as all his historic stops unfold before us, it's interesting to note, I remember the Holy Father saying how his whole pontificate was really a preparation and a pointing to the 2000th year anniversary of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he said the Second Vatican Council was the beginning stages of the preparation for this very year. Mm -hmm. You can't help but think of that uh, as you watch these events unfold. Again, not mere um, you know, stops on uh, the path of a political leader, but the Vicar of Christ on Earth, really on a spiritual pilgrimage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what a pilgrimage it has been yeah. since uh, 1978. This man has been papal journey. Yeah. This it is his 91st journey outside of Italy. It's amazing. So it's um, he has tirelessly dragged himself all over the world, yeah. infirmity and all. And we see him today commanding the attention of the world at nearly 80 years old. It's interesting as well to see how often on these trips he'll make these spontaneous side trips often. Mm -hmm. uh, if he's heading in one direction with his entourage, all of a sudden you'll see the Holy Father reach out a hand to the, especially to the children, mm -hmm. to the youth. The youth seem to have a great love of our Holy Father. Uh, Who is that? Uh, Shel Sabah. Shel Sabah, the patriarch, uh, the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem. Yes. Yes. We should explain there are several Catholic rites in the Holy Land, Father, and perhaps as we go on, through the days, particularly when we see the Pope, I believe, on Wednesday in the upper room, he'll be celebrating Mass with many of the uh, the other Catholic rites, leaders, the patriarchs of the other rites, who are in communion with Rome. Mm -hmm. The Melkite, Armenians. Uh, oh, there are, uh, there were, uh, last count, at least 22. Oh. So I well, I won't <laughs> try to list all 22. I'll leave that to you. That's your assignment for tomorrow, all yeah. 22, Father, with a description of uh, what differentiates. Please compare and contrast. <laughs> now these obviously are uh, Eastern prelates, three in the Holy Father. Father Treskin, if you recognize any of these gentlemen, feel free to jump in. The Holy Father, by the way, beaming, uh, he has a joyous look on his face. Again, uh, I, I mention this every time I do a live coverage, and I'm sure our viewers are tired of it, but I'll do it again. When you meet the Pope in person, he has almost a mask-like uh, face, particularly on the left side of his face. But you see here, during these events, particularly when he's with young people, it seems to melt away and the expression returns. And that's what we're seeing again this morning, this afternoon, rather, in Amman, Jordan. His face is very much a roadmap of pain, and you can mm. see on his face the etched lines of the anguish, the weight of his office, the, the, the deep prayer that he immerses himself in every day. It's just it's so visible on his face. And we'll be seeing more of that deep prayer throughout this journey. There will be brief remarks. Uh, we are a bit concerned at this point uh, with the transmission we're receiving. Uh, we may have to 
switch over in a moment. We're having a bit of technical difficulty, I'm told, but we will continue bringing this feed as long as we can to you. Again, only 60,000 Catholics in Jordan. That's just 1% of the population. Most Christians there are Greek Orthodox. And as we said earlier, the Greek Orthodox patriarch there seems to be very welcoming and accepting of the Pope's visit mm -hmm. and, uh, and encouraging. In case some of your viewers may not know also, when you speak of the Greek Orthodox, they are basically autonomous. Oh. Uh, they don't have, like we have, the Pont of the Holy Father to unite us in one. They are all autonomous bishops and archbishops and, and the patriarchs. What would be their relationship to Bartholomew uh, at, of Constantinople, who is the ecumenical patriarch? Right. That's, that he is called ecumenical patriarch. Mm -hmm. That means he has a, a presidence among the others, but mm -hmm. all of them make their decisions yeah, individually. Right. That's, they don't have councils. They have not, not a council as we have for quite a few years. So mm -hmm. that's the difficulty of having them even come and speak together and agree together. In unity. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, theologians would refer to that as an autocephalic bishop. He is the, the uh, head of his, his diocese, right. and uh, he's on his own, you might say. This is the Custis, Father Custis in Jerusalem. That's the head of the Franciscans in the Holy Land. And, and the, his, his name is? His, uh, Bacistelli, okay. Father Bacistelli. Yes, uh, I've seen him once or twice when I... Uh, in my most travels. Of, most of these individuals are, are in union with Rome. They are rites in union with Rome that you've seen here, the Melkites and the others. Right. There. With the exception of the Greek patriarch who is, right. it seems to be uh, following the Pope there, mm -hmm. at his, uh, just behind him. And the Pope <coughs> meeting members of the royal family. Sounds like a cry from the uh, Jordanian uh, uh, military okay. there. Uh, they're, they're greeting him with due honor as a head of state. Here are the various Muslim leaders now meeting His Holiness as he arrives for what will be a week-long journey through the Holy Land. Now the Vatican, the Holy See rather, and Jordan established diplomatic relations only in 1994. The same year, by the way, that the Holy See established diplomatic relations with Israel. Mm -hmm. State of Israel, the Pope will be going there tomorrow. A shot of the papal flag and, of course, the Jordanian flag on the right. Probably the uh, salute with arms that we're about to hear. Uh, and we will leave you now. This is the uh, papal anthem. We'll let you listen in to a moment of that.
This is live EWTN News coverage of the Pope's arrival in Amman, Jordan, the start of a historic Papal Jubilee pilgrimage. I'm Raymond Arroyo, joined by Father Francis Mary Stone, Father Kevin Treston, and Pat Madrid. We're looking at images of King Abdullah of Jordan standing on the tarmac with John Paul II. They will make some brief introductory remarks. Uh, this is the welcoming ceremony. And then the Pope will board, if all goes according to schedule, a Pope mobile and make his way to Mount Nebo. Mount Nebo is the site, of course, where Moses saw the promised land before dying. We're awaiting remarks by uh, King Abdullah, who I imagine will speak first, as is traditional at these uh, heads of state gatherings. Soldiers parading before the Holy Father. And a big moment for Jordan, we should say. This is a this is a, a, a really an unexpected leg of the trip. I don't think many expected him to stop in Jordan. The significance of that in your mind, Father? Well, I suppose because it may sound simplistic because Mount Nebo is located there. And that's where the shrine is, and that's where he will have to go. And following Moses, he will go where Moses went. As we saw in that piece that uh, rolled just before the Pope arrived, that was prepared, by the way, by the Jordanian government. And there was the mention there of fighting over tourist dollars, that the only fighting that will take place is over tourist dollars. And there is a very fierce competition at this point between the Jordanians, the Palestinians, and the Israelis over who has the authentic sites so that they can boost tourism to the region. And of course, it's a major staple of their economies. Uh, but uh, certainly not something that the Holy Father would condone or welcome. That is not the purpose of this trip, as his uh, representatives have stated over and over again. This is a spiritual journey, not a political one. But of course, being a head of state and being the Pope and a great charismatic figure outside of his own faith, there are ramifications. I think, too, since the Pope will go to the baptismal place, but not to the one in Israel, it's not a political thing. It's basically because this is where the journey begins, and, and, it, and it's... Uh, well, it was just announced, Father, he will go to both baptismal sites now. Mm -hmm. there is, what, we're, what we're speaking of is that the Jordan River, there are, there are two sites, one on the east side of the Jordan River in Jordan, the other on the west bank, which Israel now controls. These are both venerated as the spot where Christ was baptized. Uh, each side was lobbying intensely to have the Pope visit the site to confer his blessing, if you will, upon it. Hmm. John Paul II making his way uh, down toward I, what I imagine will be microphones and the start of this welcoming ceremony. Just to return and tie up that last thought, the Pope will go to both sites, both on the Israeli side as well as the Jordanian side, so as not to show favor, I imagine, to one or the other. I think it's important to add also that Cardinal Echecare there of the Jubilee Committee being greeted by King Abdullah. I can't make out who the other cardinals are, not being able to see them. Monsignor. Pat, you were saying? Uh, just that I think that his visit to Jordan is a sign of his, his esteem for the Arab community as well and for Islam. Uh, I think it's an appropriate thing for him to do to be going not just to Israel but also to Palestine or the Palestinian Authority and to a, uh, an overwhelmingly Muslim country mm -hmm. to show his solidarity with those people. Which we've seen him do time and time again yes. in recent days. King Abdullah the second of Jordan, son of King Hussein, recently deceased, making his way side by side with John Paul II. King Abdullah just greeted the papal entourage. Uh, I noticed why King Navarro Valls at the end of that line. Um, Bishop Piero Marini, who is the master of ceremonies for all these papal events, the liturgies in any event. There he is in the, on the right side of your screen. Yeah. I think the uh, now deceased King Hussein uh, as well was uh, great friends with our Holy Father as well. They, uh, yes, over time, developed they have many friendly close contacts. friendships. Yeah. And we are awaiting the beginning of the formal remarks here by uh, both John Paul II and King Abdullah. They are now entering a tent 
decorated with the colors of Jordan. Our tent will uh, house this welcoming ceremony. And the Jordanians going out of their way to make this uh, ceremony as splendid as possible. And they have really decorated the tent uh, beautifully there. Those are images, as I said, we, uh, we are experiencing some slight difficulties with our provider, so we will await the return of the feed. In the meantime, I do want to do continue talking about this relationship between the Christians and the Muslims. We have here, uh, I have a report that uh, there will be 70,000 Christians and Muslims greeting the Pope on the path to Mount Nebo, which is where he'll proceed following this welcoming ceremony. Your thoughts on that, why they would turn up? Why would a Muslim turn up to see the Pope? Well, certainly the Pope commands a international uh, respect, and I think many people are, are just... Uh, energized and excited to see him, to catch a glimpse of this man. We have the feed once again from Jordan. This is a live coverage from Jordan. We will take you there momentarily as soon as uh, we reestablish connection. And there we are, John Paul II with King Abdullah. He's greet still greeting officials of the Jordanian government. And uh, in a moment, the prepared remarks will begin a very fit and enthusiastic John Paul II. Interesting that they're not greeting the king. They're greeting the Holy Father uh, yes. singularly. Each one showing some sign of respect, a bow, certainly a handshake. Yes, a great, uh, this is, uh, as we said earlier, a very important moment for the Jordanian government to have the Pope begin a pilgrimage to the region in their country naturally has its benefits. King Abdullah is standing by. And the Pope will make his way to a Franciscan monastery on Mount Nabal, which I do want to get into uh, as, we, as we move forward. We should also mention this is the, not a ah, lady there, kneeling to uh, kiss the Holy Father's hand. Cardinal Keeler, I believe, of uh, Baltimore. Yes. And Monsignor Stern, who was in our piece uh, just a moment ago. Monsignor Robert Stern of the Catholic Near East Welfare League. Look they the run uh, several um, philanthropic missions throughout the Holy Land. They're all papal um, missions. Many of them, of course, directed toward the Palestinian people who are marginalized in the region, but not exclusively. They reach out to Jews and Muslims as well. And as the dignitaries continue to parade forward, I want to mention that this is not the first pope to go to the Holy Land. Paul VI went once before in 1964. How do you imagine this visit will differ from Paul VI's visit in 64. Pat, I'll start with you. You're in the hot seat. Wow. Well, <laughs> how much time do I have? Well, I think uh, one seconds of the... Ten or less. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, I'll... I'll no. One of the most profound differences will be, I think, the, the mark that this pope has made on the international scene that Pope Paul VI, for all of his good qualities, did not make. Mm -hmm. uh, pope Paul VI was not uh, the force that Pope John Paul II is in terms of commanding the attention and respect and, and in some cases the awe of political leaders mm -hmm. around the world. So I think Pope John Paul II's visit to Jordan, to Israel, to the Palestinian Authority uh, is a focal point for politicians and, and government people around the world. Mm -hmm. It's going to be uh, a new era in geopolitics that he has a, a knack for inaugurating time and time again. Father Kevin, your uh, thoughts on how this will differ from the visit of Paul VI. Paul VI, of course, made men no mention of the state of Israel when he was in uh, mm -hmm. visiting uh, the Holy Land. Uh, a very cautious trip and a brief one. And also, we have to say, do you know what the personality is? Pope Paul VI had different personality mm -hmm. and different uh, things he was dealing with in the church at that time than our present Holy Father has. And I still feel it's the idea of those who are oppressed, those who are in need to be free, those who are to hear the word of God as Jesus preached it. 
And that's why Holy Father is going. He's going as a pilgrim, and as a pilgrim, he's going to, re to relive the, the sacredness of his Lord and of his Master. And Paul the Sixth is a wonderful. Was uh, so Paul the Sixth was was a wonderful pontiff, a wonderful man, and he suffered a lot because he brought into us. Remember the the change of the Second Vatican Council that Pope uh, John the Twenty Third put into to uh, force, so to speak. But yet at this time, the tension in Israel. There was no Palestinian authority. The, the Jordan was not at peace. Egypt was not at peace with Israel. There was a totally different political situation. And I would say it was volatile in those days, but perhaps not uh, dangerous for the Pope himself in those days. Mm -hmm. But now for this Pope, that he is coming forward and preaching the truth and, and preaching the freedom, mm -hmm. I think he unfortunately could be more of a target than maybe the Pope Paul VI mm -hmm. was. But certainly it's the idea of of one man making a difference, one yeah. person making a difference. And yeah. this trip is fraught with political landmarks. It is, and um, I think his father mentioned uh, back in 1964, perhaps there was a little bit more of a sense of being careful uh, in what was said, and you know, just the fact that um, Pope Paul VI would be there would be significant in and of itself. Our Holy Father here now comes preaching the gospel, and his whole pontificate has really been one that points to the dignity of every human person. This Pope, more than any other Pope, perhaps, has written on the infinite dignity of every human person, baptized Christian. Especially, he points to the fact that, okay, Go ahead. Uh, he points to the fact that, uh, he, and he comes as a spokesperson for every human person. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that makes a difference. And then we're in the great Jubilee year. I mean, let's face it, this is the year that uh, abundant blessings are your favor. King Abdullah now about to make his welcoming remarks to John Paul II. Joy, we will listen in. I join all Jordanians in welcoming you to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. We welcome you to the Holy Land as a man of peace, whose message of reconciliation and harmony continues to echo throughout the world. We welcome you as a symbol of all that is pure and noble in this life, faith and prayer to Almighty God and forgiveness for each other. We welcome you as a true reminder to us all that the power of love is a much stronger and harder one to attain than that of conflict and hatred. We welcome you as a fellow believer in God, the compassionate and the merciful. Your Holiness, the people of this historic land attach special significance to your historic visit. In many ways, it parallels the visit of Pope Paul VI in 1964, which touched with its message Muslims and Christians alike. In the words of His Late Majesty King Hussein, it was not just a visit. It meant a great deal to us who believed in God. It meant the coming together of people of both religions. It was a very, very great happening. It is now your visit, Your Holiness, which brings the hope of a brighter future to those who have known nothing but the misery of the past. Hope for the Palestinians who yearn for justice and stability, a promise for the Israelis of security and acceptance, comfort for the Lebanese of a better tomorrow, and the hope for the Syrians that the sad chapter of war is finally over. It is also a prayer for our Iraqi brothers and sisters for a new, brighter day to finally dawn upon them. It is your presence that reminds us of important facts, lest they be forgotten. The virtues of faith and the absolute need for forgiveness of one's enemies. Your presence testifies to a commitment and an insistence on justice that you have displayed wherever you have visited. It is a true legacy that reinforces our determination to seek peace where war is devastating and to look for harmony where discord and affliction were present. It is a call for those believers in peace not to lose hope. Your Holiness, this is a unique and emotional moment that brings closer the meaning of tolerance and coexistence from a distant land of dreams. It is a moment 
that witnesses a pilgrimage by a holy man to a crossroad of history and geography where religion started and civilization first emerged. It is also your first pilgrimage as ordained by God Almighty. I know too well the spiritual nourishment that this brings, for I too have been blessed by God who enabled me to submit to him along with millions of believers in Mecca last week. The commonality of that experience is nowhere better expressed than in God's words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha nasu inna khalaqnakum min dhakrin wa utta wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila lita'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqakum inna Allahi alimun khabir sadaqallahu al-azim. O mankind, we created from you a single pair of male and female and made you into nations and tribes that ye may know each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is he who is most righteous of you. And God has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. As I welcome your holiness among us in Jordan during this memorable Jubilee year of peace, let me express the warmth and anticipation that Jordanians of all walks of life harbor for you. Your mission is benevolent and your cause is noble. We all pray for its fulfillment. Thank you very much, Your Holiness. Your Majesties, <coughs> members of the government in a spirit of profound respect and friendship I offer greetings to all who live in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan the members of the Catholic Church and the other Christian churches the Muslim people whom we followers of Jesus Christ hold in highest esteem, high esteem, and all men and women of goodwill. My visit to your country and the entire journey which I am beginning today is part of the religious Jewish pilgrimage which I am making to commemorate the 2000th anniversary of the birth of Jesus Christ. From the beginning of my ministry as Bishop of Rome, I have had a great desire to mark this event by praying in some of the places linked to salvation history. Places that speak to us of the moments long preparation through biblical times. Places where our Lord Jesus Christ actually lived. All which are connected it's his work of, red of redemption. My spirit first turned to Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abraham's journey of faith began. I have already been to Egypt and Mount Sinai, where God revealed his name to Moses and entrusted to him <coughs> the tablets of the law of the covenant. Today, I am in Jordan, <coughs> a land familiar to me from the Holy Scriptures, a land sanctified by the presence of Jesus himself by the presence of Moses 
Elijah and John the Baptist and of saints and martyrs of the early church. <coughs> Use is a land noted for its hospitality and openness to all. These are qualities of the Jordanian people which I have experienced many times in conversations with the late King Hussein and which were confirmed, confirmed anew in my meeting with Your Majesty at the Vatican in September last year. <coughs> Your Majesty, I know how deeply concerned you are for peace in your own land and in the entire region and how important it is to you that all Jordanians, Muslims and Christians should consider themselves as one people, and one family. In this area of the world, there are grave and urgent issues of justice, of the rights of peoples and nations, which <coughs> have to be resolved for the good of all concerned and as a condition for lasting peace. No matter how difficult, no matter how long the process of seeking peace must continue. Without peace, there can be no authentic development for this region, no better life for its peoples, no brighter future for the children. That is why Jordan's proven commitment to securing the condition necessary for peace is so important and praiseworthy. <coughs> Building a future of peace requires a never more mature understanding and ever, more, and ever more practical cooperation among the peoples who acknowledge the one true indivisible God, the creator of all that exists. The three historical monotheistic religions count peace, goodness, and respect for the human person among their highest values. I earnestly hope that my visit will strengthen the already fruitful <coughs> Christian-Muslim dialogue which is being conducted in Jordan, particularly through the Royal Interface Institute. <coughs> The Catholic Church, without forgetting that her primary mission is a spiritual one, is always eager to cooperate with individual nations and people of goodwill in promoting and advancing the dignity of the human person. She does this particularly in our schools and education programs and through her charitable and social institutions. Your noble tradition of respect for all religious all religions, respect for all religions, guarantees the religious freedom which makes this possible and which is in fact a fundamental human right. <coughs> For 
When, <coughs> when this is so, all citizens feel themselves equal, and each one, inspired by his own spiritual convictions, can contribute to the building up of society as the shared home of all. The warm invitation which your majesties, the government and the people of Jordan have extended to me is an expression of our common hope for a new era of peace and development in this region. I am truly grateful and with deep appreciation of your kindness, I assure you of my prayers for you, for all the Jordanian people, for the displaced people in your in midst, and for the young people who make up such a large part of the population. May Almighty God grant your majesty's happiness and long life. May, God, may he bless Jordan with prosperity and peace. Thank you very much. This is live EWTN continuing coverage of John Paul II's historic pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I'm Raymond Arroyo, joined by Father Francis Mary Stone, Father Kevin Treston, and Patrick Madrid. The Pope concluding his remarks there, the welcoming ceremony, a brief one. King Abdullah saluting the Pope as a, pow a person of peace. He, he mentioned the power of love there and that it's stronger than division and hatred. Uh, he welcomed the Pope as uh, bringing people together. And he mentioned that there's hope for a brighter future for those who have only known misery. 